This fish looks like a giant sea butterfly. But don't be fooled. This exotic species is wreaking havoc in the Mediterranean Sea. Invasive species are becoming a global concern. In the last 20 years, the number of non-native species in European waters has increased to almost 1,300. The Mediterranean Sea alone is home to 69% of them. And although only 10% are categorized as invasive, they can pose a major threat to local marine life. But what makes a species invasive? If a species starts to cause uh, significant ecological problems or problems for people in terms of their jobs and livelihoods, then that's when it's considered invasive. This is Jason Hall Spencer. He is a marine biology expert and he's going to explain everything. There are a number of ways these species get introduced into new environments. But the common factor is human activity. Researchers believe the main culprits are trade and commercial vessels. One way that invasive species can move around in the ocean is either attached to ships and boats or inside um, the ballast water, the water that's used to balance the boats when they're not full of cargo. Because the propagules can be released into um, waters where these species don't come from. In case you didn't know, propagules are what an organism creates to reproduce itself and spread, such as seeds, larvae or spores. Aquaculture and imports are also big vectors of species invasions. In northern European seas, for example, around 46% of non-native species arrived via oyster culture imports. Oysters from Japan would be brought over to Europe because they taste so nice, but because the shells of the oysters are so intricate, you get all of the propagules of lots of other species in there, and so they've started to spread um, and invade. But why has the Mediterranean become such a hotspot for non-native species? Hundreds and hundreds of invasive species have come through the Suez Canal. This man-made waterway connects the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea in Egypt. It's an essential trade route between Europe and Asia because it reduces ships' journeys by 9,000 kilometers. The Suez Canal was built in 1859, and for 80 years, the Mediterranean Sea was protected by a natural barrier created by the difference in salinity between the bitter lakes in Lake Timza and the fresh water from the Nile. But then, in 2015, the canal was widened and deepened. And that's meant that what was used to block the spread of these invasive species, which was a high salinity area that would kill most organisms, that's been removed. And so um, they can easily pass through the canal. Now that this natural barrier is down, more and more species are crossing over, even though the Mediterranean Sea and the Red Sea have very different ecosystems. So how do these newcomers survive in the Mediterranean waters? The eastern Mediterranean is one of the places in the world that's warming fastest due to climate change. And so the conditions that are in the eastern Mediterranean Sea, for example, around Cyprus or Lebanon, have got conditions that are perfect for many Red Sea species. And so we're seeing them invade and do really well. But climate change and trade are not the only things helping non-native species thrive in the Mediterranean. Overfishing is also a big issue as it is killing off their potential predators. Take the lionfish. It's the fastest ever known marine invasive species to spread in the Mediterranean. This venomous marine fish comes from the Red Sea and has almost no predators in Mediterranean waters. At the moment, the Mediterranean in particular is on its knees ecologically. There's an acute biodiversity problem in that all of the big fish pretty much have been hunted and killed by humans. And it skewed the whole system towards small organisms. But are the non-indigenous species really threatening biodiversity and local economies in the Mediterranean? Well, it depends on the species. Some can be pretty harmless to the environment, such as the Pacific oyster. Others can have disastrous effects. This Red Sea pufferfish, for instance, is an aggressive predator. They've even been known to destroy fishing nets to get at the catch inside. They are also highly poisonous for humans and cannot be eaten. The lionfish is also a great predator, but it has one advantage over the pufferfish. It can safely end up on your plate. Jason worked on a project funded by the European Union called ReLionMed in Cyprus to find ways to reduce its population size. The lionfish actually tastes absolutely delicious. And so there is a hope that by fishing it or even overfishing it, people around the Mediterranean could reduce its population size. We've now grown a market for it in Cyprus and it's available in, in fishmongers and in restaurants. 
But extolling the lionfish's commercial prospects is a delicate balancing act, as you run the risk of making invasive species attractive. If these species become so commercially successful, there'll be incentives not to overfish them, but protect the stocks and help them build. There are many things being done to better manage invasive species. In 2015, the European Commission launched the Invasive Alien Species Regulation. It has also joined international efforts to protect 30% of the world's ocean to help rebuild the stocks of large fish and predators. At a global level, in 2017, the International Maritime Organization implemented a convention that regulates how and where cargo boats release the water they carry in their tanks. But local and international efforts might not be enough if the root of the problem is not addressed. As long as the Suez Canal's natural barrier is broken, invasive species will continue to make their way into the Mediterranean. What's needed is the reinstatement of a high salinity area. And that can be done using desalination plants. Unless you turn off that tap, the Suez Canal tap of the invasion, then um, all of these measures won't work, will they?